Hey everybody, it's GalmanX, and welcome back to another Magic Arena Cube Draft. This will be the third time around, and in our opening pack here, we have a couple of good-looking cards for some kind of mono-red aggressive deck. Hazret the Fervent was an absolute all-star in standard mono-red decks at the time, as was Rampaging Ferocid on so much so that this card actually got banned, because it really shut off all the Abzan token strategies, uh, and they wanted to give those a little chance. Um, Tybalt is kind of okay, seems like sort of a worse... Uh, Rampaging Ferocidon, to be honest, but still a fine card. And then uh, there's like Weaponize the Monsters for a Sacrifice deck. I guess Tybalt does slot into that kind of red-black Sacrifice build pretty nicely. So lots of good red stuff here, it looks like. I don't see anything incredibly exciting in the other colors. There's like a good removal spell in white. I mean, this blue creature's really mediocre in my opinion. And uh, some random green stuff. So I think I'm just going to take a red card for... Uh, for an aggressive red deck here, and I think for me it's between Rampaging Ferocidon and Hazret the Fervent. Um, both of these seem really good. I think Hazret might be um, mildly better in like a dedicated, very aggressive red deck, but like Ferocidon's a little bit more, a little bit less narrow, because Hazret you really want... Uh, you want to cast this when you have very few cards in hand, obviously, so you want your curve to be very, very low to play Hazret. But if your curve is, then Hazret is uh, incredibly powerful. It's a very quick way to end the game with that 5 hasty power, indestructibility, and the ability to start ditching everything you draw for additional damage to your opponent. So I'm going to start with Hazret there. Not 100% for sure if that's uh, if that's better than Ferocidon or not. They're both pretty great red cards to be honest and out of this pack i do really like sublime epiphany this card is insane if you can cast it the only problem with this card is that it's six mana it's a very very expensive thing to uh, to hold up at instant speed however if you cast this spell it's really hard to lose because you get so much value out of it you counter a spell or an activated or triggered ability, or both if you're somehow incredibly lucky. Uh, you return a permanent to its owner's hand, you copy one of your creatures, and you draw a card. Just a massive swing in value. I cannot understate how powerful this card is. Um, and we just absolutely destroyed with it last time we had it. And there are some fun cards in here, but nothing, I think, along the power level of Sublime Epiphany. Of course, this is pretty much as far as possible from Hazret the Fervent as as can be, so we're not going to be in a deck with both of these cards, basically, no matter what. Even if we end up in red-blue, Sublime Epiphany is the kind of card that we're going to be playing a slower deck to play, and we're going to be holding cards in our hand, and Hazret the Fervent is just the complete opposite, so I don't know about that one. So here we do have Settle the Wreckage, which is just another great, really powerful instant speed trick. This one can be a one-sided Wrath of God. If your opponent attacks you with all their creatures, you can just exile Maul, and turn them into basic lands, which is really, really good. Crawling Barons is fantastic, though, since it can go into any deck, and it gives you a Mana Sink to play around with in the late game, make a really big land. There's also Nibble Obstructionist, which has a good cycling ability. Um, this does just shut down a few cards, like um, like Cast Off. That's like, when it enters the battlefield, you exile something, you can just counter that ability and draw a card. That happened to me in one of these games, and it was pretty insane. Um, I think I just want to take Settle the Wreckage, though. That card is just its just fantastic. Crawling Barons might be the best pick, just because it leaves us the most open, but um, I do love me a Settle the Wreckage. What do we have here? We've got a Devil's Play for red. I'm not really seeing a lot of red. We've seen, like, one red card um, in pack three and pack four here. Or, I guess, pick three and pick four here. Um... And they're both just, like, fine. They're just okay. So I don't know how much the Hazard's going to pay off here. Seeing a decent amount of white. I do like Amiria's Call. It's a land in the early game, or if you draw it in the very late game, you can just get two 4-4 four, four Flying Angels out of it, which is quite nice. Micaeus is interesting. This can do a lot of fun stuff if you end up in a plus one, plus one counter deck. Same with Reese. Reese can uh, do a lot of fun stuff if you end up in a token deck. And then Mirari's Wake... Mirai's Wake is pretty powerful too, but that is, uh, that is a two-color card there. I don't know. I think I'm just going to roll with uh, Amiria's Call to go with the Settled Wreckage here. Ooh. Oh, boy. All right, we got Aurelia Exemplar of Justice. Could try to be some kind of Boros aggro deck. We've got Luminarch Aspirant. This card's really good. It is... Uh, 
it's just going to keep getting counters on itself throughout the game and become one really big threat by itself. And if you have multiple creatures, you can just start throwing the counters on the other creatures instead. Royal Eruption is obviously pretty great. Two mana for three damage to any target. Or if you have it in the late game with a ton of mana, you can do five damage to any target. Some great stuff here. I kind of want to just take a white card here um, and stick to that. Uh because white seems to be maybe the most open color. So I kind of want to just take this Luminarch Aspirant. I like that a lot. The other white cards are pretty decent, but I think uh, Aspirant is the strongest. Okay, we have Castle Ardenvale, which is a land that can spit us out creatures in the late game. If we're ever flooded, don't have anything to do with our mana, just start dumping out 1-1s. One There's a God's Willing to protect one of our creatures few red cards here. Um, Lava Coil and Deem Worthy are just decent removal spells. Dual Caster Mage is a weird one. Copy an instant or sorcery spell when it comes into play. Choose new targets for it. Don't know about that. There's a Mill card in blue. Lotus Cobra and Karuga in green. Kind of want to just take the, uh, the Castle Arden Veil here. Yeah, I think I'm just going to keep taking white cards, and then white is the only color I'm solidly in. However, it does seem like Boros is open, because now we're seeing some more Boros stuff, like Integrity and Intervention, Sacred Foundry, and a couple of red removal spells again. Sajiri so Shelter is quite nice. Protects one of our creature, or it's just a land when we need it. Skittering Surveyor is okay uh, in like a three or more color deck. This card was pretty good in Dominaria, but when you're looking at cube, it feels like the power level is definitely down a little bit from that point. I think I'm going to take Integrity and Intervention here. Now we have Ranger of Eros. Eros? <laughs> Ranger of Eos. Kabira Takedown. Akum Hellhound. Sacred Cat. Bunch of kind of random stuff. I don't have any one drops yet, but Ranger of Eos could could grab two creatures from our deck that cost one or less, put them into our hands when we cast it. Could be good value. If we can get cards like Sacred Cat and Akum Hellhound later in the picks, that might be okay. Nothing's going to wheel out of this pack, so whatever we're taking is the only card we're getting. I think I'm going to take the Ranger. I do want to try that card out. Seems pretty fun. We have Tybalt and Weaponize the monsters still in this pack. That means that Rampaging Ferocidon was picked. Uh, we got a Mana Sink and Karn's Bastion. I only really want to run that if I end up in like Mono White, because otherwise uh, tapping for a Colorless is a bit of a downside. Guess we could take like a Turn Timber Symbiosis. Maybe I end up in that. I don't know. I, I guess I'll scoop up the Tybalt, stick to uh, a possible Boros deck here. Selfless Savior is a one-drop to pick up with Ranger of Eos. Idol of Endurance might be okay. Um, you just like put all of your cheap creatures from your graveyard into the idol, and then, uh, and then you can use the idol's ability to cast all that stuff in a turn later. Um, I guess you can only cast one of them per turn. Yeah, this seems a little bit slow, but it does give value to uh, to your fast white decks later in the game. And Crawling Baron's Wield, that's really surprising, but I'll absolutely take it. And now we can take a Reese the Redeemed. This is a hybrid mana card, so we can play it in mono white. We don't need the green mana. So now we do have two one mana white drops, and now we'll have another one here. Um, because I think I'd rather take one over a Skyclave Cleric just to have more cards to pick up with Ranger of Eos. Kind of like the All Seed a little bit more, because this can help protect uh, a big threat like uh, maybe a Luminarch Aspirant, or if we get other big threats later, we can obviously protect those as well. Now I'll scoop up a God's Willing. Just stick to as many white cards as possible here, because that is the only color I'm pretty much 100% convinced I will end up in. Now we have Hanged Executioner as a decent removal spell slapped onto a flying creature there. We have Platinum Angel, which is interesting. Don't think this is actually that good in cube, because, uh, I mean, just one removal spell, and this was basically just a 7 mana 4 4 flyer that didn't do anything. Um, there's a Cloud Blazer. If we cut out a red, we could go Cloud Blazer and keep the Sublime 
Epiphany in here and up in Azorius. The only thing that's weird about that is I don't think Azorius is going to be particularly aggressive, so it's not going to combo too well with like our little white weenie stuff going on here with self Slavier, Rees, Ranger Vios, all that kind of stuff. I feel like Honored Crop Captain might be the best card for for the uh, the white stuff that we have going on here, so maybe we just stick in Boros. But at the same time, Hanged Executioner... Hanged Executioner is pretty fine, and it also is straight up just white, uh, so it's not uh, it's not being very committal to a second color there. Nothing in white in this pack, but of course it's only pick two, which just means that this pack happened to not have white cards in it. Unfortunate, definitely not perfect. We can take a Skewer of the Critics, we could take a Valakut Awakening, either of those would be fine if we do end up in Boros. Could take a Glacial Fortress, I guess, if we end up running Sublime Epiphany, but I still think that's pretty unlikely. I guess if I'm trying to pick up a second color here, this pack just doesn't seem that powerful in general uh, for picking a second color. Like maybe Midnight Reaper? Try to do some kind of Orzhov Aristocrats thing. I don't know. I'm just going to take the Skewer of the Critics. Now we have Anointed Procession. How much stuff do I have to work with that? I have Reese the Redeemed. I have Tybalt. Hanged Executioner. We've got three cards to work with that already. And a Myria's Call, but at that point we're already playing a seven mana spell. So <laughs> we're probably already uh, winning if we're just casting a Myria's Call. We don't really need to get double the angels. But uh, I kind of do want to try out the Anointed Procession. And now we'll just pick any token producing cards very highly here. Cathar's Crusade is very similar to Anointed Procession in that it's a pretty expensive enchantment that doesn't do anything immediately. But once you start casting spells after it, it can really go off, especially if they're token making uh, spells. Because Cathar's Crusade just puts a plus one plus one counter on your whole field every time any creature enters your battlefield, which is quite powerful and especially powerful with things that make multiple creatures. Ministrant of Obligation does go well with the Anointed Procession. However, there is a Chandra here if we want to stick in Boros. So we're really just taking the Boros card here or we're taking the Anointed Procession card. Yeah, Chandra seems like she's a powerful enough planeswalker that it's probably worth taking over the uh, the Ministrant. Now we have Earthshaker Kenra, which is both a nice, quick, aggressive creature and uh, something that makes a token that could work with Anointed Procession. If we eternalize this, it comes back as a 4-4 with haste and shuts off a blocker. And obviously, if we eternalize it with an Anointed Procession out, we'll get two of them, which should basically always be lethal if our deck is working correctly and being aggressive in the early game. Ooh, Unbreakable Formation is a scary powerful card when you have a lot of early game creatures out. Put a plus one plus one counter on your whole field, give them all Vigilance and Indestructible till end of turn. Really, really ridiculous. That is of course only if you cast it as a sorcery, just during your main phase during your turn. Uh, you do also have the backup plan of just having this to basically counter a board wipe at instant speed if need be. So very powerful card. I will scoop that up. Ooh, Isamaru, Hound of Conda, is another one drop to pick up to pick up with a Ranger of Eos, a very aggressive one that'll come out, start doing two damage a turn for only one mana. However, there is a Grim Lava Mancer as well, which could be good too. Um, this gives the the aggressive red decks a lot of reach, because in the late game, once you start running out of fuel, you've got all that stuff in your graveyard, you can start just throwing two damage at your opponent or their creatures or something. I still like Isamaru a little bit better than Grim Lava Mancer in this deck in particular, because I feel like Grim Lava Mancer is really at its best when you have a whole ton of instants and sorceries that you could be casting uh, quickly in the early game, and I don't know if we have that. And here I kind of like Embercleave over Anax, because Anax wants you to have a lot of red mana symbols in your permanents to be really good, and right now red is more of our secondary color than white will be, so I don't think we're going to have a huge amount of devotion to red most of the time, so Anax will usually be like a 2-3 or 3-3, three, three. Uh, whereas Embercleave, that's just always insane when you throw it on a creature. And now we will take that honored crop captain that we wield, solidify ourselves into Boros, and take a Valakut Awakening that wield as well. Might as well. It is a modal double-faced land card, so we can play this over basically just like a random mountain. 
Chandra Acolyte of Flame gives us two little 1-1 one -one creatures with haste. That combos well with Honored Crop Captain, combos well with Unbreakable Formation, combos well with Anointed Procession, all that kind of stuff that works well with a lot of creatures. I am taking this over Cathar's Crusade because I do want to keep my curve pretty low, no. pretty quick with this deck. And while Cathar's Crusade can do a lot after you cast it, you have to, again, as I said before, spend five mana to do nothing that immediately affects the board on turn five, and then it does stuff, you know, the turn after, like turn six and later. So it can be pretty huge, but it is pretty slow for a deck that's trying to be uh, hyper aggressive like Boros potentially can be. And now, I don't know why I'm looking at my collection, I don't get to keep any of these cards. Uh, and I'll just take something random. Fresh Fire Elemental, I guess. Something random again. We've got one final pack after this. To see what we can get. I think I definitely want to pick up more, more early game stuff. More two drops, particularly. We've got a lot at one mana right now. I guess Integrity and Intervention we would much rather play as Intervention now that we are definitely in Boros. I am not playing Sublime. Epiphany, and I'll cut these lands to see how many um, non-land cards I have. With Amiria's Call and Valakut Awakening as lands, we could play, we could easily play a 16 land deck here, uh, and if we lower our curve a bit more, we could even play a 15 land deck. So, I don't think we need to really cut anything yet. So, Allegiance Landing or Banishing Light. Banishing Light can remove anything. Legion's Landing is just another good one-drop. It's actually a pretty hard pick. There's also a Heliod that can do a lot of good stuff if you have a lot of life gain in your deck. I don't feel like I have a ton right now. I kind of want to just roll with Legion's Landing for now. So Elspeth Conquer's Death is kind of slow. Morag's kind of slow as well, but like if Morag hits the board and survives, it's just going to bash your opponent for a ton. Especially giving all of your creatures plus one plus zero oh for every time they attacked. That's pretty good. Hellrider seems like the best uh, for like a really quick deck though. Whenever any of your creatures attack, Hellrider does one to your opponent and it's got haste. So I kind of want to take Hellrider first here and now I want to start cutting uh, some cards. So I'll definitely cut Fragmentize first. Whew. These are going to be some difficult picks. Heroic Reinforcements, another card that works really well with token producers with go-wide strategies. So great with the Anointed Procession kind of sub-game we've got going on in our deck. Uh, but there's also Tajik, which is really, really good at making these one-drops and two-drops into formidable threats in the late game on their own. Uh, Bone Crusher Giant is a removal spell and a creature all-in-one. Really good. Venerated Loxodon we can cast out later for cheap and put a plus one plus one counter on everything we tapped for it. Great stuff here. Magma Jet as well. Removal spell that gives us some scry. Really difficult pick. I think I want to probably take one of these monocolored cards here. I think I'm going to take the Bone Crusher Giant. I feel like that's the least likely to wheel out of all of them. And I'm hoping that one of those Boros cards at the very least can wheel. Because we actually don't have a ton of interaction with our opponent stuff right now. We've got Bone Crusher, Hanged Executioner, Skewer the Critics intervention not like a whole ton of like targeted removal so i think i like bone crusher there and bone crusher will be often casting at two as stomp this doesn't really have anything for our deck i guess we can take a claim the firstborn if we want to get really aggressive try to steal one of their creatures and smash them with it but that seems unlikely to make the cut swift response almost definitely won't this is a pretty defensive uh removal spell so i guess i'll throw claim the firstborn into the sideboard Glorybound Initiate could definitely make the cut, as could a Seasoned Halloblade or Bowmat Courier. So how many one-drop creatures do I have now? I have Reese, Selfless Savior, Isamaru, All Seed of Life's Bounty. I have four, and I only need to pick up two with Ranger Vios. I think I'm already at the point where Ranger Vios is pretty much always going to be able to pick up two things from my library, so I don't really need the uh, the Bowmat just to have more reach with the uh, uh, the Ranger. I think I want another two-drop here, so between Seasoned Halloblade and Glorybound Initiates, I don't actually know which one of these is better. They're both pretty good. This can exert as a 4-4 lifelink. This can get indestructible. I guess I'll go with the Glorybound Initiate there. I'm not convinced on that one, but they are both going to be good in this deck. They're both going to fill out that 2-drop slot quite nicely. 
Insult to Injury is probably the pick here. This can double all of our damage. With the Insult half, and then Injury. Two damage to a creature and two damage to a Planeswalker. If we play this on turn six, when we've got six mana, we can cast both in one turn and do four to a creature and four to a player. So, pretty decent card here. Basri's Lieutenant is good as well, but I've just got a lot at four mana already. Mentor of the Meek can give us a lot of card draw off of our cheaper creatures. Coom Warrior is a flip land and late game creature. Sark in the Masterless spits out dragons. Plenty of decent stuff here. Heliod's Intervention can destroy some artifacts and enchantments if we want to have some naturalize effects here. I kind of want Mentor the Meek here over the rest of this stuff. I just have a lot of creatures that'll trigger it and a lot of tokens as well that we could draw cards off of with it. Uh, on to Inversion. Ember Shieldbreaker, Reckless Rage. Don't really want to play Ember Shieldbreaker, but that seems like the best fit for this deck. Onto Inversion really doesn't seem like what we're doing here. I guess there is a red white duel as well, but it enters tap no matter what. Just roll with the Shieldbreaker there. Experimental Frenzy might actually be okay in this, but I already have to cut a lot of cards, so I'm gonna have to figure out what I'm cutting at these uh, higher mana costs mainly. I don't think I'm playing any of this, but Grateful Apparition uh, certainly fits in our color. So we did wheel both of the Boros cards and the Venerated Loxodon. Uh, we only get one of these here. Heroic Reinforcements, Tajik, Legion's Edge, or Venerated Loxodon. I feel like Heroic Reinforcements just goes the best with everything that we're doing, because this is already going to be good with just us playing regular aggressive creatures, but it's also going to be good with all of our token production and stuff like that. Um, to where, like, if we have Anointed Procession out, it's just going to be an immediate win. Insane card. And the Seasoned Hallowblade wield as well. That's a really, really uh, nice late pick here. Could absolutely use that. Feather? I don't think I'm going to play Feather. It's basically just a 3-mana three 3-4 three, flyer in this deck. I don't have many pumps, and I'm kind of wanting to cut them. I guess I do have God's Willing and um, Integrity. But, but I don't know, I have to cut 11 cards here? Well, I suppose I don't, because I've got uh, a flip land here. I'm going to try to make the curve pretty low. I've got two flip lands. Try to make a low curve, so we'll cut two. So I have to cut nine cards. Integrity, I can cast at one mana. Insult, I can cast at three. And Ember Cleave, I can hopefully cast for two if I've got a really good curve going. So that would make basically four the top end of our curve with the Amiria's Call as well. If we happen to just draw this a really late game, we can just play that. Um, but we'll basically treat this as a planes for sure because we're almost always just going to play that as a land. So that would be... Uh, 16 cards that are basically always lands, and then Valakut Awakening. We might actually cast. Um, we might actually cast that instant there if we have, you know, four lands out already, and we start drawing more. And then we could cast Valakut Awakening and throw those lands back on bottom, draw some new cards, so that we could kind of factor more in to our curve. At the same time, this is the kind of card that we're playing in the late game, so it's kind of like a 5-drop, really. Because um, we don't want to play this until we've just got a bunch of random cards that we don't want sitting in our hands. So this is kind of the curve. And I need to cut 9 cards. Reese seems a little slow for this deck, but I like Reese along with Ranger Vios and Anointed Procession. Let's uh, sort by creatures here. Oh wow, I've got a lot of non-creatures. So let's see. I mean, I guess I do just have a lot of cards in this deck period. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 creatures here. I feel like I basically just want to cut non-creatures. At the same time, as this is cube, Everything is good. So, maybe not a Settle the Wreckage deck at the end here. We are very aggressive. 
I like Chandra. I think Chandra's just going to be basically a better experimental frenzy here. It's going to do the same kind of thing where we're drawing cards with her and trying to close out the game. And she just does like a lot more stuff, so maybe we cut experimental frenzy as well. I'm going to double check how much token production I have. I really don't want to cut Anointed Procession because I do. I want to try out that fun kind of shenanigans, but at the same time, it might just not be worth it for the card that just we're tapping out for no immediate impact when we're really trying to race out and, and do, do as much damage as we can as quickly as possible. Just taking a turn off to set up our future turns seems a little bit rough. Uh, let's see. One, two... Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight cards that makes tokens. That's one out of every five. And the vast majority of them just like spit out a token once. Only Legion's Landing and Reese will spit out tokens multiple times over the course of the game. I think. I would have to look again. I guess Tybalt can spit out multiple. Chandra can spit out multiple as well. I really don't know. I have to cut eight things out of this deck. That's insane to me. I'm going to cut Anointed Procession, I'm going to cut Experimental Frenzy. <sighs> this is this is the most difficult thing in the world, six cards to cut. I already have massive problems cutting cards in regular drafts to where that'll usually take me a couple minutes but then these cube drafts it, it just takes me like 10 minutes to cut things because everything is just so powerful in general So, could go really risky and cut one more land. Cut Tybalt over Chandra, I think. Four more cuts. Maybe actually cut God's Will and cut Feather. Just move that that whole little synergy there out. Cut the Shield Breaker, because we don't know how many artifacts we're going to be running up against. And then I definitely should cut another non-creature, I think. <sighs> I'm definitely not cutting Velikid Awakening, because that's basically just another land. Like, if I cut Valakut Awakening, I'm just putting a mountain in instead. So that's not going to help me at all. And there's an argument for that, because this deck is is going to be running pretty low um, in terms of its curve. So we're going to want untapped lands basically every turn. And Valakut Awakening is my only land that is uh, just enters tapped no matter what. Amiria's Call, we can of course pay the three life for. And that's not going to be a big issue at all in an aggro deck. In an aggro deck, I think we're very uh, very unlikely to be racing most of the time. Um, as in, like, we're not going to be likely to be racing another aggressive deck and worrying too much about our life total. I think the vast majority of the time we're going to be trying to kill our opponents before they can just, like, out-card advantage us. So, the the three life on the Amiri's Call is not a big deal. I am 100% good with running this over planes. I am mildly iffy on running uh, Valakut Stoneforge over a mountain, but I think it's still worth it.
Maybe I'm taking out insult to injury. I don't know how good the the double damage thing is. Obviously, in the right in the right situation, that's that's pretty insane. But I don't know if we just draw it at an awkward time. That's going to be very sad. It's going to be very slow if we're not getting value out of the insult half. I guess now that we cut uh, Anointed Procession, we could cut like Ministrant of Obligation as well. Kind of just a 3 mana 2 one, they probably just don't block it, take 2 a turn. Yeah, I can cut Ministrant. This does seem like kind of a small amount of creatures for a very aggressive deck, but we have Legion's Landing, Chandra, Heroic uh, Reinforcements, those are all... Uh, kind of creatures? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That is the one thing that is always clear um, <laughs> in my drafts. I do my best, but uh, I just don't know sometimes. So I'm going to turn off these card styles because they are ugly. At least in my opinion. I do like the showcase styles, though. All right. Boros Aggro is what we're trying to do this time around. We'll see how well it works. I am hoping for the best. I am hoping to just curve out and crush people that are trying to play five color, because I think we, we ran into... I mean, we ran into a couple five color decks in the first draft. I don't remember the second time around. I think we ran into at least one that was like trying to do five color. Those are the decks I really want to run up against. I think I can crush those decks, but... um some mid rangey value -y kind of decks I think could definitely uh, stabilize. And if we're against another aggressive deck, then we'll just see uh, who, who out aggro's the aggro. I think I'm going to keep this. Uh, the only thing I can't cast is Hazaret here, and that's okay, because Hazaret isn't something I want to cast until it's the only thing I can cast, since we want as few cards in hand as possible to play that. Of course, we can't do Intervention here, but just having Integrity up is fine. So... We just need one land for Chandra, and other than that, we've got a few cards to play. Alright, there's our land. However, it is not a mountain, so we still cannot cast Chandra. Opponent starts with a Sulphur Falls. We will start with Legion's Landing. Pooping out a 1-1 lifelink. And we'll drop a Glory Bound Initiate next turn. So, Sulphur Falls into Emeria Shattered Sky Skyclave. Opponent is on Jeskai at the very least. Maybe we did get the Faded matchup. And we are immediately against 5 color. That would be pretty cool. Alright, send in for our one lifelink. Oh, another mountain, so maybe just Jeskai. There's Tajik, Legion's Edge, coming out. 3-2, Haste, Mentor can get first strike for two mana. They're just going to leave it out on the field. I think I'll play a mountain here so I can cast whatever I want. Turn four, I can just intervention on Tajik. I need to remember that I won't be able to deal any non-combat damage to anything other than Tajik on their field because that, that secondary ability there is very easy to forget. So I need to remember that. So... I guess I can exert Glorybound Initiate. It'll attack as a 4-4 lifelink, and then they cannot block that well. So, play... I think I play Chandra here. Make some elementals so I can flip my Legion's Landing. And I can flip Legion's Landing by attacking with these three. So I don't even need to send in the Vampire if I don't want to. I can save it as a chump blocker for Chandra, and also not just throw it at Tajik because the elementals will die anyway. So we'll attack with those three, flip our legions landing, bam, there's our fourth mana for intervention and hazrets. So I might even just keep this planes in hand to discard to hazret later. Because as we've seen in the deck building process, our most expensive cards in this deck cost four. However, there's an argument for playing more lands at this point just so we can double spell, play like a three drop and a two drop, stuff like that.
play a Seagate Reborn, paying the three life so they can get a Sphinx of Foresight out. Here comes Tajik, maybe? Tajik is going to send in at Chandra. Not going to be looking to use her minus ability anytime soon, because um, I'm not really going to cast an Integrity out of my grave, so I'll let her go to one to keep my life linker. Hey, I'm meditating here. Because I'm also not going to plus her so that she doesn't die to Sphinx. So next turn, I think they have to just attack her with Sphinx if they want her dead. Because uh, I am going to kill Jajik right now. Hmm. Not going to plus her, so let's just get those elementals out right now. So Do I play Hanged Executioner here, actually, to have a chump blocker for the Sphinx and then leave up Integrity instead? Integrity's not going to kill Tajik if they have the two mana up to give it first strike, though. So if I, if I intervention to Jeek and just attack for two, I'm accepting that Chandra's going to die to Sphinx. I mean, we're definitely sending in with those. That's, that's just certain. I can't intervention Sphinx after they block, uh, because Tajik shuts off the non-combat damage, unfortunately. Yeah, Chandra doesn't actually seem that incredibly important here. I'm gonna kill Tajik. I'm actually gonna play a land just to get my cards in hand down so Hazret's more likely to be haste. Because I need two or fewer, right? I need one or fewer cards in hand, so yeah, we're definitely still playing a the basic there. Just to lower hand size. Felidar Retreat, very scary card. Landfall gives them two twos. Or a plus one plus one counter on all their creatures and vigilance. So they're gonna be playing a bunch of two twos to try to have blockers out for all my nonsense. Uh, let's just spam out a, a Hazret here and get going. Uh, I have to cast, I have to play my mountain here if I want to attack with Hazret this turn. So we'll cast Isamaru, play my land, play Hazret. Now Hazret gets to send in and I can undeclare. Oh, that's like stop attacking with it. Okay, so if I attack with all these, they can block there and just kill my lifelinker and take eight. If I exert this, they can't trade with the initiate. Yeah, I think I, I should exert this. I shouldn't let them trade with initiate. If they don't, yeah, I was gonna say, if they don't chump, I can just discard a card next turn and they die. They have to make the chump. They're down to five now. We are very close to just killing them. I'm at 33, so I've got quite a while to survive if I somehow don't find a way to close out this game quickly. That's best conquer's death on Hazret. That'll help them a lot. Because now, because of the exert. I will only have two creatures to attack into their two creatures. They can block my 2-2 with their 4-4, my 1-1 with their 2-2. So we cast Hanged Executioner, don't have enough mana to exile something that requires four. So I guess I could just cast both of these past the turn. Plan to exile Hanged Executioner to kill their Sphinx of Foresight and potentially attack for lethal with everything else next turn. Sphinx giving them scries is definitely helping them search for outs, so I really hope they don't have, like, Wrath of God in their deck. Because they could certainly... certainly be working to draw into that. I suppose even if they do, they don't have a mountain of cards in hand. So, but Danta would help us a little bit. However, Elspeth Conqueror's death is about to return to Jeek with a plus one plus one counter on him. And Elspeth's son's nemesis is really bad too. That's going to give them a ton of chump blockers. Oh, Hellrider. Okay. Oops. I did not mean to click on my face. I meant to click on Hellrider. Boop. I mean, Hellrider's a draw. That's unfortunate for our opponent. 
they were in a very solid place to try to stabilize. Uh, and we just drew the actual nuts. Thank you very much, Top Deck Hellrider. May have been not our only hope, but one of our few hopes. Heroic reinforcements would have done a very, very similar thing as well. So there goes the first game. We managed to get there right before our opponent was uh, turning the corner, trying to stabilize. So not bad at all. All right, very similar hand. Risk of the two mana to start it off. We do have a Valakut Awakening as well, if we need to play that as a land later, but not gonna do that immediately. Gonna just cast out our stuff that we can. Definitely gonna keep here. Legion's Landing into Glory Bound Initiate. Same start as last game. Ooh, and a Stomp coming up. Seems pretty nice. Sorting Valakut Awakening to the back in case I draw more basics, because then I will actually want to just cast that. That is not a basic. Let's send in the 1-1. One, one. I don't really want to stop remo Stomp Remorseful Cleric. It's just a 2-1 flyer. That will trade for any random one of my little dorks. Here's Glorybound Initiates. Plus, actually, if I try to stomp that, they can sacrifice it, and then th that'll counter my stomp because it won't have a legal target anymore, so Bonecrusher Giant will actually go into the graveyard. So I really need to not stomp Remorseful Cleric. That would be a terrible play. Remorseful Cleric would just die. I did draw my third land now. So am I... Do they have enough to crew that? That costs three, right? Yeah, crew three for Cultivator's Caravan, so they can't crew that. So I can exert Initiate and send in with both again. Um... And then I just play a land, play Hanged Executioner, maybe? Maybe even just cast Bone Crusher. Kind of still want to leave it for Stomp on something else. Don't have any haste creatures, so I can't flip Legion's Landing this turn. Yeah, let's just get in there. The Exert is coming in clutch with the Glorybound Initiate. They're just going to chump block. Fair enough. I will take that. They're on white and blue, and they they sacrifice their creature pretty much willy-nilly, so it makes me feel like they're very. it's very possible they're going to have a Wrath, so I don't really want to commit too hard to this board. So I suppose... I still want to play at least one more creature here, though, so I could potentially flip landing next turn. I guess I can't do that because this is exerted, so I just drop Executioner. Then I can potentially flip Legion's Landing next turn if they don't Wrath me. And if they do Wrath me, it's actually not that bad. I just lose Initiate and Executioner, basically. And some tokens. I've still got quite a few stuff to go. Okay. Hieroglyphic Illumination means no wrath this turn, at least. And a tapped land means we're going to get in hot this turn. I can cast Earthshaker Kenra if I want. If I do that, I might play Valakut Awakening as a land just to get closer to the... Um, the Eternalize ability. If it dies. Could play Insult to hit them for 6 this turn doesn't seem that huge. I think I attack with everything, flip Legion's Landing. We've got four mana then. Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna go for it. I'll have five mana if I, if I play Earthshaker Kenra and I uh, play this tapped. Legion's Landing will flip, I'll have 5 mana next turn. I just need to draw basic to have enough mana to eternalize my Earthshaker Kenra. So even if they Wrath me here, I can potentially just cast the, the Kenra as a 4-4. Four, four. Again, not going to play Reese because I don't want to go too ham if they do have Cleansing Nova or something. I think I've solidly got enough creatures for if they don't have a Wrath to just sneak around and win here. Yeah, we're going to be fine, especially with that draw. 
because now I can cast Insult and Injury. Or I can just Insult in the Bone Crusher. I think it's just going to be Insult Injury here, though. Damage can't be prevented. Damage is doubled. Shoot that and their face. Now whatever they block, Yorian's going to die. Unless they crew Caravan. They could crew Caravan, block that. Take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah, they're dead. They are dead unless they have a 1 or 2 mana uh, instant speed trick. It would have to be 1 mana if they're going to block with Caravan here. Alright. Moros Aggro gets there again. That is... Two wins and no losses thus far. Not bad at all. <sighs> Alright. So we're at a thousand gold. We have to get five wins to break even here, I think. Which is kind of insane. When all we're keeping is uh just three random random card awards. I don't know. It it kinda blows my mind every time I see the payout of cube, but I guess they I guess they just realize like people are gonna want to play cube, so they can kind of just <laughs> kind of just charge whatever. Just be like, all right, just pay to play the cube. That's basically what you get. You get the experience of playing cube, which is a fun experience, but still a little, a little rough. Uh, just like this hand. This hand is a little rough as well. No red with a double red Chandra coming up. We're definitely gonna want to cast, but I do have Reese into seasoned hollow blade into potentially mentor the meek, and mentor the meek plus Reese could be. Good way to draw a lot of cards if this game goes on a while. Gotta keep it. That's like that's pretty risky, but I'm really feeling it after those first two games. Watch, everything will go perfectly, I promise. Uh-oh, against another aggressive deck. Legion's Landing's not a bad draw. Get a nice little 1-1 lifelinker to trade off with Scorch Spitter. Could also just play the Hallow Blade. I could just discard Chandra to trade with Shor Scorch Spitter. Trading Chandra for Scorch Spitter doesn't seem great, but when you don't have any red sources at all, I mean, that might not be the worst. Yeah, Mountain into Scorch Spitter makes me feel like they're just going to have... They're going to have a very aggressive deck, too, so I don't know how I feel about uh, just dropping Hallow Blade here. Let's, let's put a little Life Linker out. That'll trade with stuff. They are going to shock my little life linker. Not cool. I'm actually going to trade with Scorch Fitter. Because obviously I only have two mana right now. I'm going to need a lot of mana to start mana sinking into Reese. Now we really need a mountain. Now the, the keep looks very bad. And it was, it was not a great keep. I'll be completely honest. I will absolutely trade here. If they attack. Alright. I was going to trade with Deshandra in my hand. I'm just going to set up to block well. Again. So we'll just make that a 2-2. So either of my creatures can block and trade with Lannery. Four mountains for our opponent, I think. These, I, I really like these lands. I think they're very beautiful, but it's incredibly difficult to tell what colors your opponent has access to from across the board, which is a bit of a thing. But yeah, it looks like just four mountains here. Like, this does not give me the vibe of, of red. It's just a brown blob when I'm not zoomed in on it. Four cards in hand and four red mana up for our opponent, and they are in the think tank. Going through options. Ways to crack into my board, I'm guessing. Hallowblade is pretty hard to attack into. They're going to go ahead and Scorching Dragonfire, the Luminarch Aspirant. Seems like a generally good idea. That will get large enough to survive... All that kind of spot removal soon enough. We do draw another land. It is a plains though, so none of these red cards are going to be doing much for a while still. No attacks again. 
both of us are sitting here with three cards in hand. Opponent just drew for turn though, so now they're at four. So feeling okay right now. The fact that I'm not getting pressured super heavily when I've got like three uncastable cards in my hand feels pretty good, I'd say. Hallowblade is just really holding down the fort. Like this could have very easily just ended up being me absolutely getting crushed for for struggling on mana. I'm just going to keep that planes to discard the Hallowblade because it's not going to help me cast anything else in my deck. Everything else in my deck I need like a mountain for at this point. My most expensive cards are four mana. If I happen to draw a four mana white card, sure, I'll just play the planes then, but the vast majority of cards in my deck are already castable or need a mountain or two. Phoenix of Ash is pretty horrible for me. They're going to start hitting me for more than two a turn. Two a turn right now, but they can fire breathing that for three mana. They give it plus two plus zero till end of turn. So they'll start hitting me for four in the sky a turn. I am running out of time to draw into a mountain. And there is a mountain. So I can't injury until I've already cast Insult, and Phoenix of Ash can escape exiling only three cards from the graveyard, so they already have enough to escape it, and it'll escape as a 3-3 three, three flying haste. This Phoenix of Ash is just really bad news. Uh, suppose I play the Honored Crop Captain. Pass the turn. We're just going to be taking that Phoenix damage for a while. No pumps, so maybe a 5-drop here. I suppose anything they want to cast is most likely they're going to need the mana. Hazret it is. Go to my turn. Valakut Awakening would be my second red for Chandra, but it can also draw me new cards, getting rid of any extra lands I draw from this point on. So this is actually a pretty difficult decision between just holding on to the Valakut Awakening or playing the mountain for the Chandra. I don't feel like Chandra actually helps an insane amount right now. Because the biggest threats on their board are both resilient to Chandra. If I minus three Chandra to do four damage to Phoenix of Ash, it'll just come back with escape. Um, and then I can't even kill it with injury. So I would, I would have to insult and then cast Injury to kill Phoenix, and then cast Chandra and Chandra minus to kill Phoenix. So Chandra's not doing super hot against this Phoenix of Ash. And obviously Hazard's indestructible, so there's nothing I can do about that. So maybe I even Valakut Awakening and get rid of Chandra and the planes. I am just not in a great spot at all here. Do I wait and do it instant speed, or do I do it right now because I have some one mana white cards? If I draw into Isumaru, do I even want to just plop it down? Kind of, but it doesn't help me a whole lot, so I think I'll just pass for now. And we might Valakut Awakening during their turn. I might even actually wheel the insult to injury away too. Because I have to spend three mana doing nothing one turn, and then the turn after that I get to use it as removal. Oh no, now I cannot gain life, and every time I play a creature I lose a life. They do as well, but that's definitely worse for me. I'm going to do this right now, so if I draw any basics I'll just chump block discard a basic. We're just going to wheel the whole hand away. We're not in a good spot. Hellrider, Hazaret, and a couple mountains. Hazaret helps a little bit, having an indestructible blocker. Hellrider doesn't really, though. Most of my cards are so 
focused on attacking, that there's not much I can do if I get behind in an aggressive matchup, so... I think the keep was just really rough here. This was an incredibly slow start for this deck. And it is... We've definitely reached the point where it's just going to cost us the game. So... Sit here down to the Phoenix. I'm just going to scoop him up here. I, I don't have anything to get out of this one. Let us head into round four. Maybe not roll with the incredibly greedy keeps again. I was just on that winning high. Got two in a row. I was all gambler's fallacy in it. I guess that's the opposite of the gambler's fallacy. Gambler's fallacy is like, well, I keep losing. Statistically speaking, I, I can't lose forever. So the next game, I'm way more likely to win. All right. Oh my god, not again. Not again. That's a mulligan, and I'll keep this one. Got both our colors now. Um, kind of want to get rid of the uh, Executioner, seems like the slowest card. But at the same time, Hazard, we're pretty far off. We need two lands. Legion's Landing flipping would be one of those lands, though. And I think we throw Hazard on bottom. Pretty decent curve. Haste out a Kenra next turn and Bone Crusher Giant after that. Or more likely Hanged Executioner so we can still stomp something. Opponent starts with an Evolving Wilds, so we don't even get to know what one of their colors is yet. Let's find out. Green with that forest. Haha, take that vampire. You can't block this turn. And they are down to 17. Green-black, looks like. Yep, green-black, starting off with Lotus Cobra. That seems pretty stompable. I mean, <laughs> that can definitely curve out into some very scary stuff. So, play land, swing in. If they do not trade, they traded with Kenra. Very interesting. Okay. I guess they are not trying to ramp into anything scary just yet. Hanged Executioner it is, so I have three attacking creatures next turn to flip Legion's Landing. Get closer to casting... Earthshaker can rub from the grave and Embercleave. Three mana, green, black, and blue. So everybody gets like Soul Tide control here. That would suck. Cultivator's Caravan taps for a mana of any color. So maybe, maybe they've done it again. And we're against another um, freaking five color deck. I really want it to happen. So, I'm Ember Cleaving for not a lot of damage here, but I can Ember Cleave and cast Reese in the same turn, so that's what that's about. Now, if they go, if they just go Languish, that'll be really sad. That'll be very, very sad. Niv Mizzet Reborn! We're doing it! Alright, five color. Five color Niv Mizzet. Show me the goodies. They've drawn Integrity Intervention and Trostani Discord. They are going for it, but they're at eight already. They're at 8 already, I get to Exile Niv with Hanged Executioner hidden for 4, 5, 6, and then I just Bone Crusher Giant their face. I guess I can't just Bone Crusher Giant their face because they will, uh, they can Intervention to gain some life. But uh, I still think our best play is to just smash in, put them to 2. And hopefully they just cast Tr Tristani Discordant and try to have a lot of blockers. I mean, I suppose, yeah, I mean, even if they hold up the mana for intervention, then they don't have any blockers, so they'll just die to the attacks. Like, I can just send in, and then if they try to intervention something, I'll just, just Bone Crusher their face. See, I guess their their only real play based on what I know is in their hand is that they could intervention the creature that we have Embercleave on, and then they would go to five life. And then even if I re-equipped Embercleave to something else, they would take one, two, three, four, five. So yeah, 
it, it, they're looking pretty dead on board, even with Intervention in hand. So they'll have to cast, like, two things here. Tristani Discordant it is. So if they don't have another mana, they know I can just move the uh, move the cleave over. So I will uh, I'll do that, I guess. Scooch the cleave, and there is the concession. We did it! We ran up against a five color deck and and beat them. That was the plan all along. So three wins and. Uh, and a loss here. So we're already at a better record than the Azorius Control deck we played last draft. Um, and uh, this draft has been going on less time than that draft, because, you know, Control decks are going to historically play a lot slower <laughs> than aggro decks. I am all up for this change of pace from, from the last draft. Last draft was really fun. I mean... If, if you haven't seen that draft, definitely check it out. We did some ridiculous things. Um, being able to wipe the board and still have multiple Planeswalkers out is just really cool, and that's all I'm going to say. That may have happened once or twice. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I'm liking the, the change of pace here. So it's kind of slow. Uh, lots of lots of four drops here, but I'll keep it. Um, I think I'm actually going to get rid of Amiria's Call, because no way I'm going to hold on that till 7 mana, and that's just... I'm probably getting rid of land here, so might as well get rid of the one that I have to pay 3 life to play untapped. Amiria's Call is the kind of card where... We're just playing it as an untapped land unless we draw it on, like, turn 20. So opponent starts with Gilded Goose. We are unfortunately on the draw here too, which means my opponent is going to have a lot of time to set up before I get off the ground running. Um, because not only do we have a slow hand, but we are also not on the play. Opponent is on Gruel so far. Gilded Goose into Paradise Druid with a force and a mountain. Means they've really got the ramp going on. They'll have five mana available next turn, even if they don't play another land. If they do, they'll have six mana already. Which is absolutely terrifying. So now I can cast Reese and Glorybound Initiate. I suppose I can send in the Seasoned Hallowblade and maybe trade uh, trade Paradise Druid for, for I guess, Reese the Redeemed, because it's just pretty slow ability for this deck, to be honest. Uh, it's mainly just in here, because I can search for it with... Uh, with the Ranger of Eos. I think I might actually cut Reese, go back to the drawing board, cut that out, throw something else in here, because, you know, now that we've played some games and we've seen how the deck uh, actually operates, we are literally just never using these abilities. They cost just way too much mana. Uh, however, I think I'd still rather just have him out as a 1 1 than discard the Hello Blade. So that gives me another creature for Hell Rider as well. Yeah, because if my opponent plays, like, a big creature this next turn... Sure, Reese won't be attacking, but I doubt my other creatures will either. And then, you know, if I don't draw land and they play a big creature here, I guess I can start just pooping out what one stuff to chump block with for a second. That would be a really bad position to be in, but... This is definitely a game I could see losing. We've, we've stumbled in the early game a bit. Not the fastest hand... Um, in conjunction with a pretty large amount of ramp from our opponent, who is on the play. They do get the 6 drop this turn, so Voracious Hydra gonna come in and fight something that'll kill Glorybound Initiate, and they have a 4-5 blocker. That is very bad. Oh, they're gonna kill Reese. I am now incredibly happy I played Reese. Super worth it. Alright, if I draw a Mountain, I guess I can Ember Cleave? We can kill the uh, Voracious Hydra that way. No mountain here means I'm just stuck with what I've got on board, which means no attacks. Just a pass. Yeah, I guess they, they kill Reese because Reese could potentially just keep funneling out chump blockers, but Hydra's got trample anyway. So, chump blockers aren't going to do me a whole bunch of good. Alright, it ain't looking good. The Gruul deck has received access to their big stuff. 
Um, I think we're farthest from casting Ember Cleave. I suppose Chandra would just come out and die because minus four won't kill anything right now. I guess it kills the Paradise Druid, but it can't kill the Phylath, which is a pretty big threat. I'm just considering whether I should double block here. I feel like I should. I think I double block here if I draw a mountain. I just cast Hellrider and get ready to double block Phylath if they send that in. Uh, but I doubt they do that. They're just going to landfall it and start making their their plants four fives as well. Super bad position to be in. Not looking fantastic. We are certainly not in a position to be trying to empathy our opponent's face right now, unfortunately. So we'll throw that in the grave. Mentor of the Meek is another blocker, which gives me five power to block Phylath with. If they want to send that in. But now that they've seen the double block on the Voracious Hydra, I highly doubt they send in Phylath because they definitely know that I can just double block Phylath as well. All right. Oh, boy. If they're going to draw five cards off of Rishkar's expertise, they might not be too concerned with losing value right now. Oh, no. Into an Oracle of Muldaya. Play two lands. Put eight plus one plus one counters on their plants. Four on one of them and four on another, I'm guessing. Seems real bad for me. Oh, my God. The Gruul Landfall. Coming in hot with an Abrade on top to destroy whatever I play to block next turn. The game is very over. They do still attack with Phylath, so at least I get to stop them from putting more counters on their stuff. Suppose they do have one mana up. If they have giant growth, that'd be hilarious. Vastwood Fortification? Ah! Ah! All right. That'll definitely get me exactly plus one, plus one against the five damage. I mean, did not matter that game. We were we were handedly losing that game no matter what. All right, so if I go back to the drawing board here, what do I throw in if I take Reese out? Do I just throw in God's Willing? Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the stuff that I cut isn't particularly insane. Nothing that really helps me get super aggressive um, where Reese does not. Oh, I totally forgot about my uh, non-basic lands. I actually don't think I want Crawling Barons here, because I've been having a lot of mana issues in these games. Um, I guess I... Even though I have a ton of white cards, I kind of did an even split here, because I'm like, well, I'm pretty much 50-50 on, on colors, but I do have a lot more double red than, than double white, so some of these mana issues were definitely my fault. I probably should have cut at least one more mountain, thrown another planes. Because that'll put me at... Um, that puts me at nine white sources and six or seven, uh, if you count Valakut. So if you count if you count Valakut before it was it was split, eight white, eight red, and now we've got nine white, seven red. Wait, I just did the exact opposite of what I said I should do. I think I wanted to throw in another mountain on another plains. That was dumb. All right, we want... What is going on with my brain right now? Did I do it again? So now I have eight red. Six, six, seven, eight white. Let's throw another mountain in here. There. That would be nine red, seven white. Seems better. So probably should have focused a little more on that in the first place. Again, even with like the stumbling on mana, those the games that I've lost were games I was going to lose. Well, that last game that I lost was a game I was going to lose anyway. That one game that I was just stuck on mana forever, 100%, um, we could have been in a way better position if I just had better mana, I think. So that loss might have been 100% based on the mana building and the deck building. Um, but it was also a lot just to keep in general, too. Last game, though, that was just we were going to die. We were going to die handedly. All right, so we fixed the mana. I don't know. I feel like even this might be a little bit heavily weighted red. Is this just what it was in the first place? 
8 to 8. It might be. I don't know. I'm rolling back to that, though. Am I rolling back to that? See, this is the problem. Whenever I go back into deck building, it just happens again. And <laughs> I can never I can never commit to my final build of the deck. Okay, so I went back to deck building to figure out if there was anything I could cut Reese for that would be, like, uh, particularly greater. I guess there's, like, God's Willing, but that's pretty much... That's the only thing I'm really considering. I suppose Settle the Wreckage would have also... Settle the Wreckage would have been quite nice um, in the deck against the other aggressive deck. Um, in the game against that Gruel deck, they just... They drew, like, six cards anyway at the end of there. So even if I wrapped everything on the board, they would still have more cards in hand than me. So I think we still weren't likely to win. But settle for the, the aggro mirror might be okay. I'll throw it in. Why not? Reese the Redeemed has not really been doing anything. Heading into our next round. Three wins and two losses right now. See if we can't get at least a four-win run out of this. Obviously rooting for five wins to break even, at least. Get the gold back so we can head right into another draft. We do have to settle in hand. This is an awkward hand, though. I mean, it's, it's okay. I've got several castable things. It's just not particularly aggressive like I would enjoy it being. All right, Amelia, get out there tapped. I don't have a one drop. I suppose the other thing about settle is we can uh, we can settle ourselves to ramp up, which is cute. So they start with an Endotha Triome. So they could be like a super multicolored deck. So do I want to just try to get it as aggressive as possible here? What actually does more damage uh, quicker? Earthshaker Kenner or Luminarch Aspirant? Earthshaker Kenner is like two damage right now, two damage next turn. That's four damage total. Luminarch Aspirant's no damage this turn, two damage a turn after that. Yeah, Luminarch Aspirant... It's exponential, so, you know, over the course of maybe, like, four or five turns, it'll have done more damage total. Uh, and then it'll start just doing way more damage, but for now, Earthshaker Canner does a lot more damage in the immediate game. Oh no, this is not what I expected at all. Try land into Forest 2 one-drops, Knight of the Ebon Legion and Reese the Redeemed. Okay, I suppose I can throw a plus one plus one counter onto Earthshaker Kenra, and then, um... And then they have to trade both their creatures into it if they want to kill it. So they probably don't block here. If they do, that is not bad at all for me. Then I go planes, all seed of life's bounty. Now I have a nice little protection trick to save uh, something in the future, as long as I'm holding mana up, which should be pretty frequent. Now that I will have four mana next turn. Maul of the Skyclaves. Not what you want to see at all. Very powerful card. Plus two, plus two, first strike, and flying. And it automatically equips. It just stays on there. So I can Unbreakable Formation. Um, how good is that? That puts Aspirant and Alseid to 2-2. Two, two indestructible. They don't have any lifelink. Aspirant then goes to 3-3 three, three with its plus one, plus one counter. I think I play Hanged Executioner first and just hold up the Alcyon's ability. But Unbreakable Formation will be really good, like, next turn, I think. Didn't throw a counter on the Kenra there, because while that would make it a 4-3, which looks like it could attack in well, the Knight does have First Strike, so I would still not be attacking. So I kind of want to spread out my power a little bit more for Unbreakable Formation to make more decent threats. So Voracious Hydra for two, we're probably just giving protection to whatever nonsense they're trying to fight. Yeah, I'm just going to say no. Let's not do that. So goodbye, Alcyid. Now we Unbreakable Formation... I suppose the knight does have flying as well, so it can just block a Hanged Executioner instead of a Luminarch Aspirant. I think I still want to put the counter on the, on the Aspirant instead. If I play Chandra this turn and they don't end up killing Chandra, then I could have an even bigger Unbreakable Formation next turn, but I don't know how much longer I want to keep holding on to that. Yeah, 
I'm just gonna do it. Guess I can also exile the knight, but then they have enough mana to equip that to something else. Do I have anything to recast? No, nothing to recast with Chandra. Let's just do it. Unbreakable formation. Counter on the aspirant. Send them in. Send them all in. Let's get some chumps going. Clear out some of these creatures. Just one of them. All right, down to seven it is then. Vivian Reed. They can have one of their creatures deal damage. I've lost so much already. Oh, that's the other one. That is the other Vivian. <laughs> Get that out of here. This one is destroy an artifact enchantment or creature with flying. Destroy my hanged executioner. Okay. I do get to drop down a Chandra, make some elementals, I guess. I'm happy as a hellion to start some fires. All right, here's the elementals. Now, Luminarch Aspirant's already big enough to survive night, so now Earthshaker is as well. If I attack with everybody, they've got two blockers. If they block here and here, they take one, two, three, four. If they block. They block like here and here. They take one, two, three, four, five, six. They go to like one if they don't block both of my big things. So I'm just gonna attack with everything at their face. Because if they're gonna eat one of my small creatures, they go to like one. So I just don't think that's happening. So yep, they block like that. It's two chumps and they're down to three. Pass turn. Cute swarm. Give them some ground based chump blockers. There's two of them right now. And a cultivate, that'll be a third one. But nothing with flying means that my uh, my flying creature can get another plus one plus one counter and attack for three in the sky. You they don't have enough to minus me. again with Vivian, unfortunately. So, flying creature will just be lethal. Even though they did manage to get the four chump blockers they needed to, to block all four ground creatures, if you count my elementals as well. But we're just attacking the sky. And that will be the fourth win. One win to go to get the 4,000 gold, I think. Let me double check on that. That seems, that seems insane. I feel like you should break even at 4-3. At you don't? Oh my god, you're down 1,000 gold at 4-3. All right, break even at 5. I don't know, maybe maybe I just value the three random cards much lower than Wizards does. Um, I, I guess I do, because I don't particularly care about getting more um, just random cards in my collection, when if I'm doing a regular draft that isn't a cube draft, I'm getting like a massive amount of cards into my collection. I don't know. I suppose it is uh, it's debatable. All right, four wins, two losses. Can we win this next game, get the 4,000 gold? We need to do another draft immediately. That would be really cool. I am not going to do another draft immediately, though, because I don't have don't have a lot of time. I am a full-time essential worker. You know, if there was one thing to, good to come of this year, uh, <laughs> it's cool that the, uh, the working class, lower class uh, people like myself get to be like, I'm an essential worker. Yeah, it's just like a way cooler name than uh, <laughs> the just overnight stalker. All right, Ruin Crab is out. Well, I'm scared, but I like this hand a lot. We've got three two drops, all of which are quite powerful. Earthshaker Kenra be like, nope, get your crab out of here. You ain't blocking. Um, will not actually get the crab out of here, but make it so it can't block this turn. Smack for a lot. Aspirants can obviously make her. Oh no, that was a really dumb click. <laughs> I almost. Imagine if they didn't have the, the backup thing there. Then I was like, why are you clicking on your own Kenra? Well, because I want to attack, that's why I'm clicking on Kenra. Oh my god, Ruin Crab into Ashiok! I'm just getting milled. It's over. It's over! Half my library's already gone. I'm at 20 cards. Sorry, 21. Now I'm at 20. Uh. 
So I lose, right? That's <laughs> that's what this is here. Um, I need to be as quick as possible, so I'm playing the one that puffs, pumps all of my attackers and the all seed. Unfortunately, I don't get to attack this turn then. If I played Aspirin, I would get to put Kenra to one counter. Maybe I should have played Aspirin and all seed there. Oh no! Ashiok got me all shook. I'm playing wrong. I can't even attack into the Groom Crab now. Well, this is a thing. This is just happening. The Wrath of Ghana. <laughs> just the scoop. <laughs> oh my god. This is ridiculous. I'm at 13 cards. Turn 1 Ash. I'm sorry. Turn 1 Rune Crab and turn 3 Ashiok. I don't see how that's beatable. Ever. No matter what deck I'm playing here. Imagine I was playing like my Azorius control deck and now I just have 12 cards. I'm like, well, I can Wrath your Ruin Crab away. Good lord. Well, this is not fun. <laughs> this is just a bad time, I would say. If I put a counter on my all at all my creatures attack is 3 power, which is big enough to get past Ruin Crab or trade with Mentor of the Meek. We just we gotta hit Ashok with something, or my library's just gone. Twelve cards. Haha, -ha, we hit Ashok with everything and gained three life. Well, I think my only out is if they don't have a wrath. They did commit my thing to my deck. That leaves up an Ember Cleave. Ooh, that leaves up an Ember Cleave. Okay. Okay. We have a chance. I actually have 12 cards left. I am not uh, in as bad of a position as I thought I was. Because we did get to just nuke Ashiok last turn. Thanks to our massive amount of 1 and 2 drops. You're just going to not block? Okay, block the Aspirant. Ember Cleave on that it is. Yeah, this will be huge. Now I'm in a position where even if they do wrath us, they're going to be at a pretty low life total, and I'm about to poop out more instant speed attackers with Chandra. Talrand. Ooh, that could be a lot of blockers. Oh, but they scoop them up. They scoop them up because they don't have another land, they don't have any instant speed stuff. If they just went like Island Unsummon, that would be a huge play, but I don't actually know if Unsummon is in this cube. Because yeah, Island Unsummon would be they mill me three again. And uh, they shut off one of my attackers and create another blocker of their own. So Talrand could have uh, could have definitely stabilized them there uh, if they were just a little lucky or so. Wow, I'm actually very surprised. I I beat Rune Crab into Ashiok. I was I was 100% convinced it was over because it was like turn four and I had 12 cards left. I was like, what on what on the actual planet is going on here? This is not this is not real life. Wow. All right. I will absolutely take it. We've got the 4,000 gold. We came here to get back. And I'm playing against Squirrel. Great username. I love to see the usernames that are like, uh, when people joined in early enough that they got very, uh, very common names like just Squirrel or Cat or something like that. Uh, that's always really cool to me. Um, however, because, you know, I, I've used Gomlet X on everything forever. I just used my stupid weird name. Even though I was in the, uh, I was in like the closed beta, I could have, I could have probably got uh, an interesting uh, name that you wouldn't see very often because you'd expect it to always be taken, like Squirrel. Um, but I, I just didn't think that far. Just had to be Goblin X. And that's just who I am. All right. So, am I playing anything special here? No, I'm just playing the captain. I'm not gonna shoot up loyal Pegasus. I'm not going to stomp on your Pegasus. It's pretty adorable. Not really. As far as Pegasi go, that's, just, that's a pretty standard Pegasi. guess they get to attack with both. They didn't shut off my block here, which means maybe they have a lot of lands, so they want to... Um, they want to bring back Earth Shaker Counter with its Eternalize later. I don't know. It feels weird to me. I'm not going to make that trade anyway. Now I have three mana, so I can... Um, I can Integrity and... Stomp. That seems pointless. I think I'll just play a tapped land and stomp. I'm not playing a three drop. I'm not just going to insult for for a little more damage here. 
Uh, maybe I should have just played Bone Crusher Giant, actually. We will see. Pass turn, let them go to combat. If they go to combat, uh, I'll just stomp the Kenra if they don't play another Haste creature. Tajik is going to make me very happy because I would much rather stomp that than stomp Earthshaker Kenra because obviously Earthshaker Kenra can come back later. And if I stomp that pre-combat, I'm also getting rid of another plus one plus one counter they could have. Ranger of Eos is not bad. It is a little slow. In Intervention's really nice here because I get to gain some life. Um, how much damage does heroic reinforcements do actually? Because my creatures would all get plus one. So I heroic and reinforcements. Honored crop captain does four, and the one ones are actually two twos. They're three twos. So I do four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's pretty massive. Put them down to seven. I think I'm just going to hold up uh, Intervention here, though. However, I could also just like play Ranger of Eos, pick up a couple one-drops, so if I draw into a basic land next turn, I can play a one-drop into Heroic Reinforcements and maybe maybe win right there, because then I'd have Ranger of Eos along with the tokens there and another one-drop. Um, I'm at 12 life. I feel like there's not a lot that could just immediately kill me if I just drop a Ranger of Eos here. But I'm mildly worried, and I really like that life gain off the intervention. They are stuck on three right now. So they're pretty far from actually eternalizing Kenra. Evolving Wilds gets them closer. They're still two lands away. I think we're still in a position where they're going to be dead before they have the mana to, um, to eternalize the Kenra. Please put that on Kenra. Yes! Oh my god, this intervention was so clutch. I'm so glad I held that up, because that was a fantastic turn for me. Now if they want to equip that, they've got to... Um, They've got a waste to turn throwing it on a creature that can't even attack. And now I get to do the Heroic Invention play for 10. They're down to 4 life. Pretty sure we've just got this in the bag now. Elspeth Sun's Nemesis does give them several blockers. That gives them 2 blockers. They'll have 3 blockers total because Pegasus can block now that they have more creatures. But with an Ember Cleave, we should be able to sneak in lethal, right? Um, Unbreakable Formation won't sneak in lethal, but it makes sure none of our creatures dies. Yeah, I think, um, I think Embercleave sneaks in lethal here, so I'm just gonna send it. Because Embercleave with the, uh, the trample, right? First strike trample? Or double strike trample? Yeah, this is definitely lethal. This is 100% lethal. There's the scoop. Pretty scary game there, but it went really well. Really, really glad I had that intervention to deal with the Mall of the Skyclaves on the Earthshaker Kenner. That was a huge, huge, huge turn for me. And now we're at 5,000 gold and three cards, at least two of which are rare. So getting great rewards at this point. Maybe I can make it all the way to my first seven win cube run. That'd be pretty cool. I mean, not as cool as it would have been doing, a, you know, like a cooler strategy. I feel like... Um, Boros aggro is pretty pretty standard, pretty basic kind of deck, but you know, if it gets there to seven wins, it's not that bad. I'm fine with it. All right, here we go. Final boss, final round, and I am yet again without red mana. However, I only have one card in my hand that I can't play. That's insult to injury. I can cast integrity. So I can still do something with this, even if I draw, don't draw a mountain. I've got powerful two drops, but it's all at two mana, so that's a little bit awkward. This might be worth a more... I, I don't think so. It's not very good, but I don't think it's quite worth a mulligan. Opponent starts with two white cards as well. Or two planes as well. And a fearless fledgling. Velcut Awakening is a red source, but it comes into play tapped, so I'll play that next turn. I have enough two drops to where that coming into play tapped is not much of a downside, because I'll just play a two drop here, two drop next turn. Seems fine. Fearless Fletchling and a Luminarch Aspirant of their own, and a Sky Marcher Aspirant. Just all of the Aspirants. This is really bad. Fearless Fledgling is going to be flying in for a lot of damage very quickly. Definitely playing this land. Two mana here. 
to just play Hallow Blade, have another blocker that uh, is basically an indestructible blocker. I think so. Don't think I'm attacking with Aspirin. I'm definitely not holding up integrity if I'm just going to be blocking. And Initiate is not going to block well at all. So we'll just play Hallow, Hallow Blade. I suppose the thing about Initiate is it would uh, it would race pretty well by giving me a nice large life linker. Hopefully I don't need it though. Oh my god. Yeah, we're against the, the full mono white. Kinda what we were we were going for at the beginning. There was a lot of white open. Taking five in the sky now from Fearless Fledgling. Of course, if they ever don't landfall in a turn, then it will be on the ground. So at least we can jump block it in that scenario. I do have my second mountain, so I do have four mana now as well. I have enough to intervention on their Luminarch Aspirants, I guess. I would want to do that before they go to combat so they can't get another plus one plus one counter on one of their things. Um, at that point, I will be taking two from Remorseful Cleric. I think that's okay. Fearless Fledgling might be hitting me for six, though, which is huge. Maybe I play Hanged Executioner and leave up Integrity. I don't think I'm casting Integrity, though, if I do that. But if I play Hanged Executioner, the next turn I have the mana to exile the Fledgling with it. Because if they have a planes, if they have a land this turn and a land the turn after that, Fearless Fledgling just kills me. I suppose... Eh, I'm gonna pass to their turn. I'm gonna pass to their turn. I'm gonna intervention their Luminarch Aspirant. If they do have a land this turn and next turn for Fledgling, at least next turn I can chump block with the token that comes out of the... Um, with the token that comes out of the... Hanged Executioner, and then I'll leave the Executioner itself to get rid of Fledgling. I just would prefer not to have to do that, because I could trade my token for a Forceful Cleric. They do have a land this turn. Give that flying, hit me for 8 in the sky. They're going to attack with one of their other creatures. Oh no, Aspirin is flying too. They've ascended. They've ascended! They have the City's Blessing. That is very, very bad. Very, very, very bad. 10 go to 5. Oh, this is huge. In a bad way. Skewer the critics is a thing. <laughs> Not really what I'm looking for, but it is a thing. Well, I'm dropping Hanged Executioner. That's the only way I'm going to block these flyers and not immediately die. If they don't hit a land drop this turn, um, then I guess I get to, to trade with their two ones. That's kind of cool. Putting a counter on one of my flyers isn't going to do anything until there's two counters on one of them. Once there's two counters on one of them, it could be a 3-3 and I could just eat one of those things. I don't think I'm going to have time to do that, though. They're just going to keep pressing in on me with those flyers. So I'll just put the counter on the Hallow Blade, so at least it's big enough to block a 1-1 vampire and not have to discard a card for indestructibility. Not that it's particularly likely to be blocking a vampire anytime soon. If they're attacking with everybody, I'm just going to block their own Hallow Blade with my Hallow Blade. Please, not a land. If it's a land, uh, this is basically over. If it's not a land, I'm still in a really bad position. But they can't just attack with Fearless Fledgling for free in that position. Then I do get to double block with Aspirant and Hallow Blade. I double block that with Aspirant to Hallow Blade, and then... Uh, okay, well now I can't do that. Cast out, get rid of Hallow Blade. I don't have any viable blocks here. If they attack with everybody, I can't... I can't exactly triple block Fledgling. Because I'm at 5 life. So I have to just stop as much damage as possible here. I mean, I guess Cast Out on uh, Aspirant works as well. Either of those things, I, I have to now just Trump block. Which is very bad. Very bad. Okay. I go to five if I do this. So I can't do that. I have to block Hallowblade. So 
I guess we'll hit the um, slightly the slightly worse creature, the one that doesn't fly. But I guess now I get to get rid of that before it can get indestructible, so that's kind of cool. So I take four and I go to one, and then they'll have one, two, three, four attackers next turn. I don't see how on earth I'm going to get out of this, but I'll try. I suppose they have no blockers, so... It doesn't even matter that they don't have blockers. I don't have anything with lifelink out. I mean, if Hallowblade had lifelink or something, maybe Embercleave would be like the play. But even Embercleave on uh, on Hallowblade, I'll hit him for 10. That's just not enough. So I think I discard Embercleave. Maybe if I could like insult into Embercleave, but I'm, I'm way less than enough mana to do that. So I think I just discard uh, discard Embercleave. We'll see what we draw, but pretty sure this draft is going to end at the six win record. Not quite going to get there. All right. What is it? A mountain. We have enough to play a glory bound initiate and skewer the critics. Not going to be enough. That'll be. I'll have two blockers for their three creatures. So they'll just be exactly dead. And no lifelink still. Glory Bound Initiate can only exert on attacks, obviously. That'll be game. Especially if they draw land. If they draw land, it wouldn't even matter here. If they draw land, it wouldn't even matter if I could have made another blocker. Oh my god! Ah, three cat planeswalker coming in hot. Give something a plus one plus one counter. Give it indestructible until end of turn, or they can just put out one one tokens for all of their non-token creatures that are attacking. All right, give a vampire indestructible. Don't attack with all three. They attacked with all three. They saw lethal and they took it. We're going to exactsies, and that is game. So. I suppose it's worth noting, I didn't realize until literally right now, I could have just discarded uh, Injury. I could have discarded Injury to my Hallowblade to be able to cast uh, Insult. I could have discarded Insult to my Hallowblade to cast Injury for my Grave at any point there, but I didn't have enough mana to cast Injury and Skewer. Oh, I did! Oh no, I could have survived a turn! Well... With Basri as their next draw, I was going to lose that game no matter what. And with Adanto out, I mean, they were going to keep making blockers. But I just realized, I actually had a really cool combo I didn't even realize. Um, I could have discarded Insult to Injury so that I could cast Injury from my grave. By casting Injury, it would do two damage to one of their creatures and two damage to their face, which would then trigger Skewer the Critic's Spectacle cost, which with the Spectacle cost, I could then cast Skewer the Critic's for only one red, so I could have killed two of their creatures there in that one turn so that I would maybe have enough blockers, but the problem is when I discard a card to give the Seasoned Hallowblade Indestructible, it taps itself, so I would still end up in a position where I had exactly one less blocker than they had creatures. So, Still would have died, but that would have been a cooler way to go out, and I'm disappointed I didn't see it. And um, the other reason I'm disappointed I didn't see it is because, you know, I didn't do all the math until right now to realize that that wouldn't have been enough. If I had noticed that and thought it through, maybe, you know, it could have been enough, and I just didn't see it at all. So if it was enough and I didn't see it, I would be very disappointed. But uh, I didn't see it, wasn't enough anyway. It happens. 5,000 gold and three cards. Not bad at all. I'll take it. That'll leave me at almost 8,000 gold. Almost enough for two more cubes. So, pretty nice run. We'll see what we open here. As always, at the end here, I'd like to thank you all very much for watching. And remind you to stick around if you're here for more Magic Arena content, especially more drafts. I'll probably be talking about the sneak peek uh, call time previews later this week. They're, um, they're setting out... Uh, like a couple cards every day for the next couple days, so I'll probably talk about them once all of them are out in a little video. But other than that, just be a lot more draft videos until we hit the main call time spoiler season in January. So as always, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you again very soon.